This is your DM guide for the Stormlord's Wrath, the first expansion adventure for the Dragon of Icepire Peak from the D&D Essentials Kit. Hi, Bob here, and welcome to Bob World Builder, where we learn how to have more fun playing D&D together. So hit that subscribe button for weekly DM guides, player tips, and D&D news. Now, continuing our Dragon of Icepire Peak DM Guide series, full playlist linked in the description, we're diving into Stormlord's Wrath, the level 7 to 9 expansion adventure available for free with the download codes inside the D&D Essentials Kit box set or on D&D Beyond for only $4.99. We're going to start with some background on Leilan, the Sword Coast town where these adventures take place then walk through each of the seven quests that make up this module, highlighting the coolest parts and the few things you should probably change. Use the timestamps below to skip around to whichever section you need, and as always, comment below with your tips, your questions, and your awesome stories from playing this adventure. Here we go. Stormlord's Wrath is designed for one to six characters of seventh level and it's the first of three expansion adventures following the events of Dragon of Icepire Peak. It starts by saying you, quote, need the D&D 5th edition core rulebooks, particularly the monster manual, but you totally don't. As far as I can tell, all the monsters are included in the appendix or they're freely available through D&D Beyond. So Leilan is the main hub for this adventure, much like Phandalin was for Icepire Peak, and the towns are pretty similar. Leilan is also a former mining town in a stage of rebuilding. Once protected by an adventuring company called the Swords of Leilan, Leilan has been overrun by monsters when a local wizard's tower, the House of Thalivar, was corrupted during the Spell Plague. Today, the town council and settlers are funded directly by the Lord Neverember of Neverwinter, the big port city to the north along the high road. This adventure does a great job of including helpful DM notes about how your party can influence Leilan's rebuilding. And interestingly, the buildings and NPCs of Leilan change somewhat across these three adventures. The Leilan of Stormlord's Wrath includes Aubrey's Peculiarities, where a whimsical half-elf sells random magic items, trinkets, and tools. A barge yard, where your party can rent boats from the gruff elderly dwarf. A fishery that serves as the town hall and market that mysterious wizard's tower, the House of Thalivar, a small island riddled with strange idols and prophetic omens, a shrine of Lathander, where an outgoing young halfling can heal your party's wounds for a price, a town square where your party can purchase weapons, armor, and anything else you want them to have, and a settler's camp just outside of town where all other town business is conducted. Whether your characters are mercenaries for Lord Neverember, or spies for Waterdeep, or they have friends, family, or property here, or simply a love of adventure. Your party is the only thing that stands between Leilan and two powerful cults. One, the evil storm god Talos featured in Icebire Peak, and another, the evil god of undeath, Mirkul, attempting to raise an undead army. And the first starter quest gives your party a taste of both. Attack on the Wayside Inn. An oddly shaped building sits at the juncture of the Tribor Trail and the High Road. Two entrances into the building are apparent, a smaller one at the northern corner and a larger one suitable for beasts of burden and wagons near the first. Right now, both sets of doors are under attack by humanoid figures. They appear to have already breached the smaller door and are starting to make cracks in the larger. Before we get into that, I love this full color map because it can be used as a model for any tavern in your game. And this exciting first fight involves one zombie for each player character busting down the doors and one wraith for every two characters rounded down, excluding sidekicks, who don't actually appear until after your party engages the zombies. And this familiar mode of balancing is used throughout the adventure. Also, each of the zombies are branded with a skull on their foreheads, recognized as a symbol of Mirkul with a DC 15 religion check. This is an awesome way to start your adventure at a tavern, and I love the NPCs here and throughout this adventure because they have concise descriptions that give you enough information to roleplay them well, but leave plenty of information up to your and your party's imaginations. 
However, it would be nice to have artwork for some of these characters. As far as I can tell, there's only one new art piece in this whole adventure. But I was pleasantly surprised to find that more than half, perhaps as many as three quarters of the NPCs throughout Stormlord's Wrath, are not men. Because when I make NPCs on the fly, they usually end up being a dude. So I appreciate having mostly not dudes built into the module. Now the one thing you'll need to change, two of the four workers here at the Wayside Inn are members of the Cult of Talos. And this is great, but it's supposed to be a surprise later, and it's way too easy for your PCs to figure it out, especially if they play Dragon of Icepire Peak. One, there's a half-orc. It's unclear whether or not they're actually a cultist, but their presence is probably enough to put your characters on guard. Two, the bartender, who is a cult lieutenant, wears a trident pendant to quote-unquote appease the many sea gods? But this might not raise alarms because he also gives your party free drinks all night. The main problem is the smith, who straight up shows off the three lightning bolt symbol of Talos on bracers and armor that she made herself. So I would definitely replace the lightning bolt with waves or anything else ocean related. After their stay at the Wayside Inn, the second starter quest begins as your players arrive at the outskirts of town. A normal day in Leilan. Roughly 50 people stand in a clearing just off the high road, where the forest to the northeast and the swampland to the southwest give way to grassland for a bit on each side of the road. The beginnings of gardens or larger fields of crops are half dug here. The people mill about in panic, some shake in fear, others shout in anger, and in the center of it all, an enraged dwarf waves her arms and tries to get those around her to listen. A bored-looking human in a chain shirt and shield decorated with the sigil of Neverwinter stands next to the dwarf. He finally bangs his spear against his shield to quiet the tumult. A series of bullet-pointed statements guide your roleplay through this tense discussion between these frustrated town council members, the settlers, and the party. Then, the first challenge here is to wrangle the town's children who have nervously or foolishly scattered about the fields during this meeting. The book suggests several types of skill checks that can be used to accomplish this task, and the idea that one of the children can become an instant admirer and fan of a player character. Then, rushing immediately out of the town toward the crowd, strange knights bearing a symbol with three lightning bolts striking ride horses made of water, accompanied by a wagon full of archers pulled by another set of the water steeds. It says these... seahorses? Cannot be attacked or harmed, but I would definitely let them be dashed by a clever use of a spell. Then, the council asks the party to take care of whatever remains in town, where they'll have to face several berserkers and a tiefling kraken priest at the fishery in the midst of summoning water elementals to kill several unconscious prisoners in the adjacent marsh. This will likely be a challenging day for your PCs, but then they have plenty of downtime to help rebuild and it's totally up to you when to introduce the first follow-up quest. And these four follow-ups can be completed in any order, but I suggest starting with the House of Thalavar. Balanced for 7th level, this mysterious wizard's tower dominates the town and will likely be the first thing your players want to investigate. When they approach, they'll meet four nervous-looking Neverwinter soldiers who describe unusual ghostly sightings. And if your characters are insightful enough, the guards will reveal that their leader has been acting strangely. Their leader is an ink-stained wizard, tirelessly working to decipher the encrypted notes of the tower's original wizard, who used this place as a beacon to the other planes of existence. But he doesn't know that the long-dead wizard possesses him every night, crawling his body up to the remains of the planar beacon. There's an awesome table of ghostly events to spook your players while they explore, and if they manage to encounter the wizard's ghost, he retreats into the ethereal plane at the first sign of trouble, so the ghost can only be put to rest if the characters find the old wizard's journal and see recent notes in the same purple ink that stains the new wizard's robes, or otherwise learn the location of the ghost's body so they can bury it with a ceremony spell, perhaps performed by the Lathander priest in town. Or they can summon the long-dead face servant of the wizard to tell the ghost that he is in fact dead. Hopefully these summaries are expressing just how cool these quests are. So even if your players don't take them all on, I highly recommend you read through them for DM inspiration. 
And speaking of inspiration, I need to thank you because this community is growing faster than ever. And as you may know, I'm extra grateful for this because this is my main job right now due to COVID-19. So all of your likes, shares, comments, subscriptions, and support on Patreon are really paying off. And it's so inspiring to me to continue growing and making the best videos and adventures and podcasts and behind the scenes content that I can. Check out my Patreon link below for free samples of all that other great stuff. And now you can even get cool badges next to your name in the comments if you join as a channel member here on YouTube. More info on that coming soon. For now, the next quest in my suggested order is Missing Patrol because it's also balanced for 7th level characters, and your party doesn't reach level 8 until after their first two follow-up quests according to the milestone advancement rules. Here, a stonemason tells the party that one of her friends, a local soldier, has not returned from their recent patrol in the Mirror of Dead Men, the giant terrible marshland outside of town. The sergeant doesn't really seem to care, but he'll help by indicating the patrol route on a map. Right where the high road meets the mirror, the patrol was captured by a marsh-dwelling, giant snail-riding, nomadic tribe of lizard folk, who take hostages as offerings to the three rot trolls who would otherwise attack their own people. If the party loses the trail of these wandering lizard folk and snails, they'll face dangerous encounters like a yuan Ti abomination, a pit of snakes and a giant bubble of marsh gas, quicksand and alligators, the rot trolls fighting each other? and a half-dead hydra fighting off mercenaries hired to capture it by the Waterdeep Circus. When they eventually reach the camp of 50 lizard folk, hopefully your party goes with diplomacy, as all they have to do to free the prisoners and earn 500 gold pieces is finish off those three rotten trolls. And as hard as it is to pick favorites here, this next quest is guaranteed to be a crowd pleaser. It does a great job of weaving the story back together. Aid from Phandalin, balanced for 8th level, where the town council hires your party to escort a herd of several hundred giant goats across the grasslands to Phandalin. What could possibly go wrong? Wyverns attack, ogres attack, so animal handling checks are important here, but the real action of this quest is in Phandalin. And there's a great DM note about highlighting the NPCs your party cared about in Icefire Peak and having them give your adventurers a proper hero's welcome. It's not exactly clear what these hundreds of giant goats are doing while you're in Phandalin, but the herder heads straight to Barthen's Provisions to sell some of her goats, where your party may learn that a new assistant at the Lion Shield Coster has been a little preachy about Talos lately. They may also find her lost lightning bolt brooch at the ransacked Shrine of Luck, and Harbin Wester will tell your party about strange weather and some recent disappearances. If your party goes to the Stonehill Inn, they'll learn about another mysterious newcomer and potentially find out that he's keeping several skull-branded ghouls in the basement of an abandoned shack on the edge of town, and that his coat is covered in thorns and burrs from the Mirror of Dead Men. If the party doesn't deal with these threats while in town, both cult groups attack when they're leaving and there's a big DM note about how to run a three-sided battle. But the important part here is that the party needs to find a pair of lenses. Glasses? I don't know. No picture. And a note on the Talos cultist explaining how to find the hidden final quest location with a map that they will get in the next quest, Foul Weather at Wayside. This 8th level quest brings your party back to the Wayside Inn to stop the cultists there from completing a hurricane-like ritual. Fully rested on their journey back from Phandalin on an otherwise perfectly sunny day, they'll see lightning bolt-shaped clouds over the Wayside Inn, and soon after their approach by disoriented settlers and a soldier all soaking wet and warning of intense rain, hail, and lightning strikes that killed one of their horses. One soldier stayed behind, and your party will find her at the edge of the storm, fending off three sets of armor constructed by the Wayside Inn Smith. These deadly armored elementals have advantage on attacks within the storm, disadvantage outside of it, and a stunning lightning bolt strike attack that can curse your PCs and make them more likely to be struck by lightning from the storm. But they can avoid the strikes by praying to Talos, if they want to do that. Then. Just like the first quest, 
they'll see some humanoid figures struggling at the doors, but these are commoners, impaled by tridents, and removing the tridents requires a DC-15 check or kills the victim. Definitely not a family-friendly scene, so I would just have the commoners banging on the doors, hopelessly trying to get out of the storm. Also, the doors are locked and trapped, but I imagine the windows would all be broken at this point. No matter how your party gets inside, they have 10 minutes to stop the ritual once they do. So you can either show your players a 10 minute timer and pause it during combat, or simply describe the growing intensity of the storm to keep it moving. The cultists inside aren't much of a challenge, but the statue of Talos in the basement is deadly, unless your characters quickly sever the lightning bolt connection to its creator, the smith. Your party can also be aided by the soldier, the innkeeper, and a sneaky gnome wizard if she joins the fray. But assuming they survive, they'll find some awesome loot and a map to the shrines of Talos, which when viewed with the lenses from Phandalin, reveals the final quest location, Thunder Cliffs. First, your PCs must interview two ship captains that can take them to these cliffs. A wacky, reckless tabaxi with a fast and agile ship, and a cold, logical dragonborn with a well-defended one who secretly happens to be a recent convert of Talos. Though, as written, he'll only defend himself if found out, so you should definitely have him try to stop the PCs before the end of their journey. Whichever captain they choose, your party has the same few encounters along the way. A mutiny, a visiting captain warning about a ghost ship, and of course, the ghost ship. Then, upon arrival at the cliffs, the party is attacked by an invisible stalker, manticores, and several other creatures depending on whether they approached by land or sea. And the shoreline is trapped with an alarm spell. Though, I would lower the DC-15 checks to notice and disarm this alarm, because if the party has time to sneak around and explore, this location is loaded with great encounters. Like the disgruntled cultist who can be tricked or persuaded to aiding your party. The creepy cannibal coven of sea hags who just want to gossip, dance, and drink. And provide us with the single, new, and awesome art piece in this adventure. The cult lieutenant, cursed by Talos and willing to help your party if they can heal him. A strange geyser that can transport creatures to Waterdeep Harbor or the Plain of Water a psychosis-inducing hot spring, lots of sweet loot, and the exciting final encounter with the radical pirate general of Talos, Gadriel the Reef Reaver, and her elemental stormhound, Tooth and Claw. The final chapter, ending the adventure, includes potential quest hooks and suggestions for how your party can help rebuild Leylon. And with all that gold, they have a lot of options. Grace and I just recorded a new Patreon podcast episode about the many ways to spend your hard-earned gold. And shout out to Ross for joining Patreon this week, and to Jamie and Cartmageddon for joining as my first YouTube members. Thank you for watching, and keep building.